Hello, welcome to Chapter 3 Podcast, the show for readers of science fiction, fantasy, and romance. This is Season 3, Episode 10, and today we're back with more of our Witcher read-along discussing The Time of Contempt by Anders Oshkowski. Very exciting, the second full novel in the Witcher series. And of course, if you want to toss a coin to your podcasters, you can join us on Patreon or channel memberships for access to exclusive bonus content for each episode. This episode's bonus content will be discussing the use of sexual violence against women in fantasy. So another light topic for our Witcher. In fairness, my content. idea was slightly lighter this time. It's your fault is dark. You know what? It was my turn to come up with something so we can do your idea next. Yours I'm just saying for once either. I'm just but saying. it's it's not light, it's just lighter than yours. <laughs> it's true. It's true. So, you know, for some fun light discussion, Um, but first to, we're gonna talk about time of contempt. I have notes. I have to take notes on these books because they are so all over the place. But um well, lol, yeah. this is not when they are all over the place. You haven't gotten to all over the place yet. Okay, but a lot, there's, like, so many things happening. Oh, my God. I know. I'm just saying, um, like, get, like, in the headspace yeah. of, like. Yeah, it's like, going to yeah. get This is more, good practice. It's it. training wheels. Oh, boy. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be great. Um, I liked this. I think I maybe liked it slightly less than the last one, but pretty similar. I don't know. How about you? Yeah, I, I would, I mean, I gave them all five stars up until the end like the first time through and i'm still basically doing that like it's uh within five stars you know they're higher and lower so yeah i would say mm -hmm. i like the previous one a bit better but um in terms of rating it's not different yeah i think i've been giving a lot like like the first one got four and a half and then i think they've all been like four stars but this one is like a lower four and the others are like higher four <laughs> But um, yeah, I I am enjoying it, and uh, it there's just so much going on. We have a lot of Siri in this book, and I guess do we want to start? Which with, again, like, I was gonna say monster? like this is not a lot of Siri. You're going to have a lot of Siri. <laughs> this is still mostly Geralt by comparison. Oh well, and it's not that much Geralt. <laughs> A lot more Geralt. I think, well, also, this one actually does have a lot of Geralt. It's more that the last impression it leaves you with is theory. Because really, Geralt's in it for quite some time. It's more that's that true. we kind of switch over to being about Siri, and then that's where we end. That's so, true. like, he's yeah. in it quite a bit. He is. That's true. But I think Siri is in every chapter, almost every chapter. I mean, there's some, some chapters with Geralt and Yennefer that there Siri are, is which notably I not in. <laughs> <laughs> well, except for at the very end when they wake her up with their loud love making. Did you notice that? As one does. <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh, good. <laughs> we have a pun in the comments that needs acknowledgement. Uh, did you feel the contempt from this time of contempt? Listen, the the repetitiveness of contempt is probably what made me like this slightly less. To be honest. Well, I kind of brought this up before, just that all these books, like you always know why they're called what they're called, like you hear reference to the phrase or to the word or to the concept like in the preceding book and mm -hmm. also during the book. So like um, in uh, Blood of Elves, we heard about the Blood of Elves and like here we heard a lot about the time of contempt and we've heard the phrase baptism of fire and like you're always like it's if it's like the thesis of the book, like it's constantly doing the thing that every essay is supposed to do where you're supposed to like be showing how you're arguing for your thesis. But it really hits you over the head with like time of contempt and she's a child of contempt and they were the children of contempt I'm like okay i get it it's a lot yeah yeah i do wonder also about translation with stuff like that because like it would mm. be just as repetitive presumably if like whatever is the phrase or the word is occurring this many times and is being used I, but i also don't know if the title of the book is also the same phrase that would oh. be referring to contempt all the time it might be but there also might be nuance to why it like works better or or maybe actually works better in English. Who knows? But like I was wondering about like um, what the word because like contempt is a very specific kind of word with very specific yeah. connotations. And I was wondering about like what the original Polish word is because it's it's not malice. Malice is different from contempt. And so like mm -hmm. the 
you know, like what is the word in Polish and what connotations might it have that contempt doesn't have or what connotations might contempt have that the Polish word does not have? Yeah, it would be really interesting to know if anybody happens to know the Polish versions in our live stream. I don't know that we'll get lucky enough to have that, but <laughs> please tell us or if you watch someone watches it on replay. Um, yeah, it would be interesting to know too, because I also know they change titles a lot of times in translation. So I don't know. Or names was... from Buttercup to Dandelion. <laughs> or names. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, how did the, oh, we have a comment. How did the editor not notice the contempt thing by the 400th time it was used? Yeah, I mean, it is a lot of contempt. I have it several times just in my notes to myself on this book. So. I Yeah, it's definitely something that like, if it's something that bothers you, it's going to bother you. To me, like, sometimes that kind of thing bothers me in books and sometimes it doesn't because like, if it's done, you know, quote unquote, right or right for me, um, mm -hmm. it's it takes on um, the vibe of like the way poems have a refrain and mm -hmm. it becomes like the even though it's still a prose novel, then I kind of begin to regard it as a refrain. And mm -hmm. like By Force Alone by Lavi Tadar, if you think this book has the word contempt a lot, I don't ever read By Force Alone because the amount of times that he says By Force Alone, and that was written in English, so <laughs> you can't be like, oh, it's the translation. Oh, but man. to me, like it read very much like this was the refrain. Mm -hmm. um, and so it felt very intentional and had almost a, a poetic cadence to me. So like every time I came to the word contempt here, if anything... I don't know if you've seen the Boondock Saints, um, but there's. Uh... I have. Yes. Polish. Well, do you remember the part <laughs> where I won't much. actually say it, but he uses the f word like ten times in one sentence, um, in this like this like ranty like moment where he's just like using the f word in every kind of way that you can use it in one sentence, oh, and one yes. of the brothers goes, "Well, that certainly illustrates the diversity of the word." <laughs> so like. That's kind of how I feel about contempt in this book, where like it's used in, it's not always the same way. It's not mm -hmm. always the same thing. It's not always like the time of contempt, because you also have, you know, like other times when the word contempt comes up over and over again. Yes. So like it begins to feel like, well, surely this is an appropriately named time, because look at all the ways it's creeping in into different, it, it manifesting itself in different ways. Right. Well, and you have also the Gooseberry Chronicles. Wait. <laughs> is this true that no. in Polish the entire series is called no. the Gooseberry Chronicles? Oh, because what's her They're name? Just Smells trolling like me and my okay. my irritation with Yennefer's scent. I don't think her scent was mentioned in Time of Contempt, so five stars. <laughs> <laughs> you don't miss the gooseberries, Leah. <laughs> oh my gosh! I decidedly do not. <laughs> yeah, I I got I've got to say I mean I guess it makes sense for this, but it's so sad that like Geralt and Yennefer finally have a moment. He says, I love you. And then like all hell breaks loose and he ends up in a forest recovering for like months. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's their vibe, isn't it? That's, that, I guess that's how that goes. Happiness is not in the cards. <laughs> oh man, that's not at all true. Okay, yes. I was like, that seems wrong, but <laughs> okay. It was mentioned once. Jessica was it? Noticed I it. must have, I was busy with the contempt. <laughs> your contempt for gooseberries look Maybe. okay all i'm saying is that other books have probably said lilac and gooseberries as many times as this book said contempt and at least with contempt it's like the thesis whereas lilac and gooseberries is simply repetitive there's no reason for that if you're going to complain about repetition i don't know maybe there's a thesis there we're just not understanding it's making me want to smell <laughs> gooseberries <laughs> Oh my gosh. Um, where do you want to go with this? Because like I, there's like, do you want to go in order? Do you want to talk about like certain characters? Well, despite being kind of all over the place, I think mm -hmm. it does kind of give you, um, it like get, gives you each part like um, separately, oh. if that makes sense. It's not like A Song of Ice and Fire where you keep cycling through perspectives. So you keep circling it, back to a, it's a narrative much more... thread. Yeah, this was nice because it was much more linear. Like there are some flashbacks. Well, not just linear, but, but it's like we're going to do all of Geralt here. Then mm -hmm. we're going to do all of Ciri here. And it's not mm -hmm. like switching back and forth between the two. So like by doing it in order of like the pages, like you're going to kind of cover that by topic as well. Because it kind of doesn't jump around that much. Yeah, I love I love these comments. Yes, they're leading up to a berry-based comment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... 
When gold can't back your currency, I guess it'll have to be gooseberries. <laughs> Oh, I feel like we need we need shirts that have something to do with lilac and gooseberries. <laughs> I read the Witcher series and all I got was the scent of lilac, <laughs> lilac and gooseberries. And gooseberries. <laughs> I, w- I wish I smelled like lilac and gooseberries. Oh, man. What's funny is I was just talking about this in my TBR video that um, is not up yet. But um, the scent of lilac to me is associated with the book series. And it is not this one. I mean, the actual scent, like not the word lilac and gooseberries. Yes, obviously the mm-hmm. phrase. But I mean, like the smell of lilacs is mm-hmm. the Green Bone Saga. Oh, that's interesting. I happened to have a lilac and vanilla scented candle just like uh. a- among my candles. And then when I was reading Jade City early on in the book, one of the chapters is called the lilac divine. And I was like, hey, I have a candle called that. I don't know if this is at all like what if there's even lilacs in this chapter, but like, let me light that candle. And then it just kept burning the whole time I was reading the book and like could ravenously reading the book. So like that scent became like linked in my Part mind. Of it. With the book. Wow. That's so interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I did appreciate that this was more linear than the last one. There were some flashbacks, mostly when Dandelion is explaining things to Geralt, and you get like these random asides in where is it, chapter five, I think. Um, <laughs> but other than that, it seems like it follows a pretty linear timeline, which was a nice change. But I'm not. Forget. A- where did we open in this book? Like, I'm forgetting, like, where the last there one ended a, and where this one started. So there was a manticore, and Geralt is, like, basically following after Ciri and Yennefer, taking out assassins who are going after them, who are trying to get Ciri. That's pretty much where we're starting. And he's he goes to, like, the two guys to try to get information about Siri and like what the child of the elder blood means but then they eventually don't want to tell him anything oh yeah 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 okay. yeah. I feel like well I think we talked about this also last time about how these books they despite having a thesis statement that is the title repeated throughout they mm-hmm. don't really have like a story for each book mm-hmm. so that's why I also like from my memory of when I first read these books and even now as we are currently reading them I'm like I forget where the cutoff points are because you just like even this book Mm -hmm. it just kind of ends like we're like okay we're just gonna cut it there you're like okay (laughs) this is why I take notes chapter by chapter notes to myself because there's no way I'll remember like what all happened otherwise it just doesn't follow a normal path um, let's see, comment. I'm so glad the book commits to Dandelion and not between calling him Dandelion and Dandelion. Yes, in the audiobook. Yeah, agreed. I have to assume, though, that that narrator was instructed to change how he was pronouncing it. You would think, but who who knows, really? It's weird. In general, I think the narrator is very good at pronouncing all of the mm-hmm. names and words and doing different accents. I, I do like the audiobooks. I think they're they're very good. Yeah. Which is which is nice. Um we have Siri this feels like Siri's YA novel. I wouldn't say YA. <laughs> I mean I would. <laughs> Because it's kind of her like, oh, I'm going to like go off in the city with this kid for the first time and like do things. I'm not. It feels like her teenage rebel years. This is what she doesn't do that for that long. No, I know. It's really more Geralt politicking with Yennefer and like Siri needed a reason to like disappear. Yeah. No, I know. But she like, but it's like a big part of a chapter. And then, you know, you have her in general. I feel like it's a lot of her wanting to go and try things on her own and like take more um control of her own life and like what she's doing and she's, what she's giving doing. young rainira mm, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes i can see that but um yeah i mean yeah honestly this book i don't think is obviously serious in it a lot but like mm-hmm. it's not mostly about siri it just like the lasting impression of where it ends is a lot of Siri, but yeah. all of the lead up, lead up to it is Geralt getting information, Geralt politicking with Yennefer, Geralt sleeping with Yennefer, Dandelion arguing with Geralt. Like, 
Well, it's still about Siri, though. It's like getting information about Siri. And yeah, but it's not like cool. her. Like, it's like that's like the perp, the yeah. ra- the reason for people doing things. But right. that makes her more of a plot device than like. Not that I think the yeah. narrative treats her as a plot device, but I'm saying that like her presence in this book is less her physically being present and more just like she's motivating people's behavior. I guess. I guess I felt like she was present a lot because we had her showing up with with Yennefer in chapters one and two we've got her whole little interlude in the city in chapter two then in chapter four she's like a medium in a trance and like is doing some stuff with magic we've got um and then like there's less of it in chapter five but then like chapter six and seven are all theory so I mean there's a lot of her like I said it's not that there's not a lot of her but I feel like there's an equal amount of Geralt. Because the beginning doesn't have Siri and it's just Geralt. And also there's all the whole, the whole interlude with Geralt and Dandelion where she's not there. So like there yeah. are definitely times when he's around and she's not. And there's yeah, definitely yeah. times when they're both there. So like on balance, it's at least equal. I guess I didn't feel equal to me, but I do think there is Geralt. Like there's a reasonable amount of Geralt. In the again, book, I think so. it's because she's like the topic, even when she's mm-hmm. not there. And then yeah. again, the thing that like the flavor that's left in your mouth when you leave the book is mm-hmm. very serious. It's definitely very serious. Yes, for sure. Um, yeah, I did think it was interesting. We have a lot of her fighting in this using those Witcher skills, though. It's like she takes. We've got her with the wyvern. Got her taking down a knight who's trying to capture her. It's <laughs> a lot of uh, everybody. But notably, Siri. the witchers taught her how to fight, not how to heal. Yeah. Why would Why would she need to do how to know how to do that? Right. Right. And I, you know, there's all this politics. We see a little bit more of, um, like the the whole thing with the emperor of of Milkgard is interesting because he is looking for Siri. People think he wants to marry her, but then people are like, no, maybe that's not what he's doing. But then he figures out that like this fake girl is not really Siri. Yeah, well as soon as he sees her, he's like, yeah, that's not Siri. But it's yeah. fine. Like we're just gonna keep saying it is while I continue to look for her. Mm-hmm. But I mean in the previous book we had the whole everyone's looking for Siri for different political reasons because the throne mm-hmm. of Sintra is really valuable. So the easiest way to get the throne of Sintra is to find Siri and claim mm-hmm. her either to take her, to kill her, to marry her, like whatever. So right. she's uh, a pawn. And it's, it is suggested in the previous book that that's a possibility to get a fake Siri. And here we see that come to fruition. Yep. Yeah, and I think Ger- well, and I think it's met suggested early in this book to Geralt, and he's like, "No, don't do it." But obviously, somebody did it anyway. <laughs> um, well, we also question. see this, this is the book where, because in the previous book, Geralt makes his big speech to Ciri about neutrality, and mm-hmm. here we see by the end of this book him coming to realize that neutrality is. Um, he he sort of comes to the conclusion of that old adage about like if you do nothing in the face of oppression, then you side with the oppressor kind of like conclusion that he comes to. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, this book is kind of like paying off a lot that's set up in the previous one, the kind of Mm -hmm. like um, tying up what is suggested in the previous one. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. um, This is a question. Does Siri hook up with the outlaw band in this book? Yes. At the end of that at the end of the book that happens um the rats the rats which is pretty rough i'm like i could have done without having like such a i wasn't expecting because i was close to the end of the book and then it's like oh great we're getting like a sexual assault of series scene good that was yeah, yeah. end with a bang mm-hmm. did not mean that as a pun but yeah well, and especially, too, because at first you think, oh, the girl's protecting her. Nope. <laughs> I mean, yes, but I no, mean, but, yes, also. but also. no. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, that was difficult. But, um, yeah. And she's assaulted twice. Yeah, like, there's, like, the guy who tries to, and then... 
It's one and a half times. One and a half times. It was, it was hard too, because there's a whole thing of like her thinking to herself, well, I'm not alone anymore, but then also like trying to like wash it off or it's like, you can tell it's like, she is very, it's. Which is why I think like it was handled. Like this is an instance where it's not just, oh, let's have a female character get assaulted because that's shocking. And then we move on. Like, it's very important for her character and the way that it goes down isn't cartoonish and it isn't like really grossly violent just to shock you. It's yeah. it's quite like realistic and messy because it's not entirely violent or cruel. There is like kindness as a part of it, which is what mm-hmm. makes it like makes victims of things like this often feel like weird kind of ways about their abusers. Cause like it's often people that you do care about or that claim to care about you that are abusing you, which is why yep. people find it difficult to kind of even realize that they have been. And yep. I feel like the fact that that's how he depicted this is and having her reaction to it be like, not really knowing how to feel about what just happened yeah. to her um no I think felt, that's not felt, something we see often i mean i do agree i thought the way it was the way it was depicted was uh yeah i mean fairly realistic and i'm just i guess i'm curious because it happens so close to the end of the book what i'm curious to see is what's he gonna do with that in the next book and is he gonna you know like how well is he gonna handle sort of the like ongoing trauma of that for Siri? Not just know. trauma, but like this is a not a, this is a person she's going to be around, right? Like this isn't like someone she met. This happened and then they parted. No, like, it's like she's, she's gonna. This is the together. beginning yeah. of a relationship. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, well, this is where again, like we talked about this early on in the series, and I think it's worth revisiting kind of every time and kind of checking in with the topic of like male gaze and versus you know feminism, and mm-hmm. that I think they can coexist. Because, like, certainly he describes women physically a lot. Certainly we get all their clothing described, you know, blah, 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 blah. But we also, again, we once again had menstruation referred to. Like, one of the things in her kit is a tampon. Yeah. Um, which is, like, how many male fantasy authors do you know of that have included a tampon in their book? <laughs> that was great. Although it is kind of funny that there's just one. <laughs> but, uh, so we have that. And then, again, the way that sexual the sexual assault is written from her mm-hmm. perspective and it's not written for shock. It's not written for mm-hmm. just this like, Oh, the violence of war. Isn't it terrible? Like it's a character yeah. moment that's complicated. And it's like, we often hear more from males, but not women can be also um, mm-hmm. un- not understanding of things. They'll be like, well, if someone knows they've been assaulted, they know they've been assaulted and it's this really cut and dry thing. And like, there's some people that think that there's a way for a woman's body to shut that down. If it's legitimate, like people are very like weird about how they like, like how could anyone be abused? And like, you know, like like, people don't understand the like weird gray areas of things. Or like, if you say yes in the beginning and then you say no, they're like, well, you were leading them on. So like showing how messy this is and how the, because that too, they'll say, well, why didn't she come forward the day after it happened? Because like showing this scene and how anyone mm-hmm. reading it can be like, this was an assault, but I'm not at all surprised that Siri wouldn't immediately, not that there's like police officer for her to go to, but if there was, like, I wouldn't be like, well, obviously Siri would immediately report this because like, it's not that simple. It's right. not that cut and dry. And your feelings about it are not that simple or cut and dry. And so like, these are things that like, not that men don't get abused in this way as well, but it is typically a more like female problem and certainly in fantasy. And the fact that he's depicting it in this like really complicated, messy way, um, I think is yeah. quite feminist. Yeah. I mean, because it doesn't, and it's, it's, I mean, I don't feel like it's overly lengthy and graphic. So it do, it also doesn't, it doesn't feel like it's being written just for like gratuitously. Well, and this also happens, like, very shortly after we get this whole thing about how unicorns mythically only, like, appeared to maidens. Oh, yeah. And uh, and then something about unicorns realizing that a maid is a maid for too long, then that's weird, and they're not going to want anything to do with them either. (laughs) Well, and then when Siri meets a unicorn and is, like, and it's not doing what she expects, and she was like, I only kissed him. Oh, man. But I think, again, like, because he has been referencing fairy tale and myth a lot in these books. Mm -hmm. And the way that we often have virginity tied to magical things. And we have, um, uh, what's it called? Um, Fertility as Mm -hmm. a part of magic. And, like, these things have often been a part of, like, fairy tales and magic and, and reasons also for writing things in a certain kind of way. 
So I like that he's bringing them into the story and introducing those topics and then complicating them. Yeah. Yeah. We have a comment saying he's, oh, he, I guess you're right, Jessica. He did say that there only needs to be one tampon because it's reusable. So it's so. Um, a, a diva cup. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Ye fantasy diva cup. <laughs> I like it. Sustainability, you know? And she could use it for other things, apparently, because she sort of MacGyver's it into something else. I, mean, I do exactly. like the thoughtfulness of including something like that. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, like, w it's interesting, too, because this reminds me of, in, in Chapter 5, there's this whole, like, thing of, um, like, there's war happening and numbers of, like war supplies and expected deaths and like the leaders of the military are like listen no you know no pillaging no killing no raping women we're just here to stand here and like be helpful right like that's what the heads the leaders tell their next in line and then by the time it trickles down to the lay soldiers it's like eh don't do too much pillaging, no murdering. And if you rape someone, do it quietly and out of sight. <laughs> As Abercrombie would say, you have to be realistic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay, great. Um, so yeah. But yeah, I was thinking a lot, or sorry, go ahead. Oh no, we just, we had a comment that said, I did wonder how others felt Sapkowski handled the female portions of the character because it is clearly better than good kind, but not better than female authors, I felt. Yeah. Um, well, it depends on the female author. Not every female true. author is good at handling this either. That is accurate. There are female authors who don't do a good job either. So I think this is like reasonably well handled if you're going to deal with those things. Well, I, I think don't think it's perfect. For but... me, an important just kind of like an easy like line in the sand and then you can quibble about like gooder or worser but mm -hmm. like just like if you want a dichotomy of good versus bad it's like what was it was there intentionality behind choosing to include this and right. did you handle it perfectly could you have handled it better blah 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 blah. those questions can be answered later that the most important question is did you put this in for a reason beyond shock and mm -hmm. if the answer is yes you're like m maybe you're on a you did it like a very bad version of good, but you're still mm -hmm. on the side of good. If like you had a purpose behind putting this in other than just like, well, that makes it grim dark or whatever. Right. Or like, Oh, we're just going to be edgy with this. Like this, this felt more, um, <laughs> power in first Abercrombie reference. Take a drink. <laughs> Actually, it's not the first Abercrombie reference. I referenced Abercrombie earlier. <laughs> No, control oh, no, yourself. No, I didn't. I didn't. It was before we went live. I referenced uh, Never Crowley. Never mind. I didn't. <laughs> That's funny that I was the one that did that, though. Um, back in the day, some. Oh, this is interesting, Jessica. Back in the day, some women crocheted tampons out of cotton, so I can totally see being able to unwind and use it for something else. Huh. Okay. Yeah. If you find a picture, put it on Discord. That's yeah. That's really interesting. I am um, making something very cutesy and frilly with like lace edges and <laughs> I mean I know it wouldn't be when you say crochet I'm picturing something very decorative <laughs> you know you need some fancy tampons um okay what else I'm like what else is on my list of things well I mean I we... mentioned this briefly but I didn't really talk about it the fact that Geralt is your kind of like this is the Witcher series right and he often grandstands about his moral positions on things and the fact mm -hmm. that he's made like kind of eat his words and realize that he was in the wrong and like makes a grand speech about how he was definitely in the wrong mm -hmm. at the end of this book um you know that Geralt isn't like the like I guess he could easily be read as this kind of like author insert of like might makes right and like this libertarian ideal of the the man just going out here and like taking care of business with the sweat of his brow and the sword on his back and he has a moral code of his own and blah, blah, blah. But like that's called into question here. And he himself comes to the realization that he was so sure because he wasn't like, I kind of feel like neutrality is best. He was like pretty like, this is the, the answer. This is my truth. Yeah. No one yeah. can shake me from that. And of, like in the worst way, he's forced to confront um, that he was wrong. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I think these books in general do a good job of kind of always complicating everything that they bring in. So like, okay, you have this like prophecy and maiden in Siri, but like, she's not like what you would expect from sort of this like mythic archetype. And Geralt is this like lone wolf, literally the white wolf of Rivia, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like he's also not um, always right. And a lot of what Geralt thinks and does isn't what you'd expect, or he's forced to change what it is. Dandelion isn't exactly what you'd expect. Yennefer isn't exactly what you'd expect. Like everyone is always more and less and different than what they would see more than you would assume. Yeah. And I think we get, we do get a lot more about the prophecy in this. Um, this, and it's interesting to me that like, there seems to be this assumption that Siri herself will not remake the world with darkness, but rather that she would be the mother of a prince of darkness that would remake the world. But is that actually correct? Or is she the one who has the potential to? And it feels like, um, like it feels a little bit like maybe it's trying is to Is the prophecy with... of ice and fire about her? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. But no, but like it's it feels like it's trying to in some ways play with the the gendered expectations of like what people assume, like what they assume her value is or her role might be versus what it actually is gonna be. And then Siri being caught between these two sides of things where she's having to make a decision about like which direction she wants to to go. Well, and we see that also kind of echoed in Queen Calanthe's own past and how mm -hmm. she kind of carved out the up, like ability to rule and then kind of had to, was trying to have legitimacy through a male line herself. And then that kind of like didn't work out. <laughs> uh, she got Siri, yeah. but yeah, we, I think it's a sexist world, but again, it doesn't, it's not a sexist world by default, or if it is, it's still it's not something that's just kind of like established and accepted and we move on because it's part of the scenery. Like everything in right. these books is done with intentionality and is always questioned and is always commented on. So like, that's why again, okay, you have a medieval-esque world with like women in dresses and men with swords and it's a very sexist world. And you could mm -hmm. easily write that off. It's like, well, that's just how the world is. And we're just going to have an adventure story in there based on those rules. And you could do that and it could be good even, but he has set up this world in this way. And then used that as an opportunity to then have conversations about that. So the role of women, the role of fertility, the role of virginity, the role of like succession and like um, matriarchy versus patriarchy. And like, these aren't things that are just like, oh, well, obviously you need a prince because that's in how inheritance works. Like we talk about it and we like, this is a really like important plot point. And we have characters with different opinions on how that should work and whether or not it's good. And, and we don't, use characters either to like kind of like simplify and grandstand because it's not like he's trying to make the point well women should have been in charge all along look how great queen Th calanthe and siri are they are much better rulers than all the men and all the women sorceresses are better than all the male sorcerers no like everybody is messy and complicated like mm -hmm. the assault is messy and complicated like yeah. so that's why like even if I don't always think everything is done perfectly, like he's like always like asking questions and making it yeah. a, a discussion and making it something that he's asking you to question through like what his characters are doing. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree. I think it's done pretty thoughtfully, uh, which is, which is interesting. I, I guess one other thing I noticed, cause I was thinking about how it, it feels like the second season of the TV show was maybe pulling from the last book and this book a bit. Well, and they I revealed the something others. in the TV show that doesn't get revealed until the end of the series, which is like, oh, okay. Yeah. I had heard that, that that was something that, yeah. Um, but like in the TV show, they spend more time on the whole thing of the elves and the elf queen. And here you get a brief part of showing how she's having trouble. She can't help her people the way she wants to because of her alliance with um, like the leader of Nilfgaard and that it doesn't get as fleshed out whereas i think in the show they do a lot more character development of that side of things with queen calanthe no with the elf queen daisy in the book i don't think she's named oh. daisy in the show i was but looking at chat a little bit and then i lost track of who you were talking oh. about we were just talking about calanthe and i was like wait what <laughs> <laughs> i think i missed something <laughs> 
Um, yeah, no, the um, the elf queen, how she can't, like we get like a brief part explaining how she can't help her people because of her alliance with Nilfgaard. Um, but that it's, it's kind of vague and you don't get a lot of development of that. Whereas I feel like in the show, they did a lot more yeah. with her character. Yet, okay, okay. Interesting. So there will be more. I mean, there's more of every. I mean, obviously, the show yeah. also like you know added stuff in for like Jennifer's backstory that's only um, ever implied. Um, so for us, for the as sprawling and kind of wild as these books are, it's weird mm -hmm. that he is kind of what also weirdly efficient about his storytelling because like mm -hmm. part of me is like, oh, this just kind of gets away from him and kind of goes in all these different directions, and and that is true. But that's kind of like more of a pacing issue because like when it comes to what he is trying to convey and what he does want to mm -hmm. tell you about, like, even though I feel like it's kind of like a side, you know, like we've gone off on a tangent here. Nevertheless, the tangent is very efficient. <laughs> it's very efficient at like telling you what he wants you to know. Yeah. And about like who these characters are, what their backstories are and how that informs what they're doing. So like he's pretty good at showing and not telling, even though it's very kind of like to the point. Yeah, I agree. So we have somebody saying Francesca. I'm guessing this is maybe the name of the elf queen in the show. Because in the book, her name is Daisy. Which I'm not shocked that they would change that for the show. That's kind of bland. <laughs> it's probably also, well, it's like they changed Dandelion to Yaskier. Like, mm -hmm. I think it's just probably the name of the flower in Polish. I, w I kind of wonder if in Polish flower names have a different connotation than they do here but also just like the word for daisy might be a much more impressive and beautiful word Maybe. than daisy yeah <laughs> or is here daisy is like childish yeah yeah so Not it could just be a nicer name, name in polish yeah. it's very possible it's interesting how they do that um but yeah, so what I haven't, what I hadn't really thought about before, which is like, I don't know why I hadn't really thought about it before. I feel like I, uh, that's um, that's on me, like <laughs> idiot. <laughs> um, that like when he was writing these books, he's writing about the Soviet Union. Like that's what these books are about. Nilfgaard is the USSR, mm. and like, like as a Polish man writing these, like when he started writing the series, the USSR was around. By the time he finished writing the series, the USSR had fallen and the Soviet states had been freed. But the way that like, as soon as like you think about that and the way they talk about appeasement and the way they talk about alliance and the way they talk about like fighting the invasion of Nilfgaard, like oh, that's you're like, oh, <laughs> it all just completely makes sense. And you're like, oh, it's so yeah, <laughs> that, makes, that does make a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah it's interesting when people I think are writing about, about things that actually happened in this kind of a way I guess I because I, I know it was you know written in Poland by a Polish author in Polish and does obviously draw on general fairy tale folklore and Polish myth and folklore so I was always right. kind of like oh like Polish history Polish folklore mm -hmm. Polish and I was like no Polish current events <laughs> also <laughs> yeah yeah but make it a little bit fuzzy. Well, and that's where I think it becomes so much more interesting to look at Geralt's insistence on neutrality and then him coming to realize that neutrality is not going to work. No. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. when you, when you, like, if that's always, I mean, it's, it's an interesting, like, in a vacuum, just, like, a, an interesting realization that works across time, across history, whatever. Like, it's not the first or last time that neutrality is an issue. But when you realize that it's as a, author in Poland at the time of the USSR writing about the dangers of neutrality. <laughs> mm -hmm. <You're> like, oh. <laughs> I yep. get it. <laughs> yep. It all makes sense. <laughs> yeah. 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 We haven't talked about Triss. Triss Marigold. Yeah. Which it's interesting because she is involved in this plot that goes very awry, I guess. It's a little unclear what exactly was going on with all of that or what they were trying to accomplish. You mean the coup? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I guess, is it just of the council? Is that what they're trying to take over? Yeah, well, I mean, like, that council, like, rules all of their order. Would that mm -hmm. be the word? Yeah. 
because there's also the now it's again about neutrality because like in theory they were all supposed to be neutral advisors they're not supposed to take any one part in this like global geopolitics right. um and but they are very much are now taking sides which is not what they previously were about mm -hmm. so it's again a conversation about what to do about the ussr <laughs> yeah and what happens when you have people with relationships with each other that end up on different sides of things and you think you can protect people and you can't because maybe things get more violent than you anticipated. Also, very interesting. Someone said, think UN. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, there's a... Uh... I mean, well, this is where, again, like, just we talked about, um, like, women's issues and assault and things being intentional. But, like, that's the part that I guess we kind of tend to have more of a high alert on, like, hey, why is this in here yeah. and why are you doing it? But, like, he's treating that the same way that he treats everything. Like, he doesn't have violence for no reason. He doesn't have, like, um, backstabbings and altercations for no reason. He doesn't have, like... The, all these conversations, all these violent, like all the, the violence that is enacted in these books is about like how far people are willing to go for certain things, how far people, what, how much are people willing to put up with before they're willing to do something about it? Because like, there's a lot of violence and there's a lot of people who see that violence and still do nothing. And so then like by ramping up the violence that people are forced to witness or be complicit in or enact and like the escalation of that and how far you can push people in any given direction and what ultimately is motivating that and driving that like these are all the conversations that he's having in these books it's not just like oh stab stab sex sex like, no you know? yeah no, which like a for a book series it. that inspired video games like i think people often write them off mm -hmm. especially when it's like oh it's the witcher series and it's just like like chunky like oh, ripped guy on the cover right. with a sword who's like i'm a witcher and it's like I can I understand why you assume these books have no subtlety. But right. you're wrong. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it makes me wish that I because I, I don't know so I know some about this this kind of history, but I do feel like knowing more might you might make a lot more connections. Let's see, there's another comment. I had not considered the USSR connection when I read. I could see the USSR connection, but here I thought it was more sort about how truth. sort of truth, yeah. Um, I thought it was more about how Poland was nearly conquered throughout history, kind of thing. Well, and I think it might be a combination of things. Well, I mean, I have I heard that argue some that the books are an allegory for like for European, like, right? It's, it's not like a one. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's not yeah. a one to one because he also there's like history to what has happened in the past so i mean but yeah, I, I meant more that like that would be what is on his mind like mm -hmm. whether he wants it to be or not kind of so like he's writing this like epic story that's about magic and prophecy and destiny and drawing yeah. on polish culture and polish myth and story and whatever else he finds interesting but just like the time and place in which he himself is writing this that like that is the very real thing that's going on and Absolutely. like there is there is conquering and warring that's gone on across europe for all of time but the mm -hmm. way that nilfgaard is this like massive force that all these disparate like um kingdoms are like trying to figure out how to address this are they going to work together are they is every man for himself do we just ally with nilfgaard like that is the ussr <laughs> yeah well and it's not uncommon like you know jr or tolkien for instance definitely had things in the lord of the rings series that were inspired by his experiences in world war ii so well, he claims not but yeah obviously are you calling are. mr jolkin tolkien rolkin a liar maybe he is just in denial and needs <laughs> needed to work through those things but uh but i mean it's like it's pretty clear that there were some things in those books that were drawing on experiences he had it's that are very specific to world war ii so i mean it's not it, it makes sense like and there are other examples of of things um like different speculative properties that where you can see when you make those connections i actually think sometimes it's really interesting like um the 
the like the second iteration of the Battlestar Galactica show, which is amazing, <laughs> um, was really was was taking place right around 9-11 and all of the stuff that was happening with like Islamophobia and terrorism and stuff. And so you can really see the way that they're exploring the ideas of like the current political climate and the things that they're doing in that show of of like to that time period when you when you're aware of it. So I just I just think a lot of things do that and it's it's interesting. Have you seen Battlestar Galactica? I mean I know what it is and I've like seen bits of it, but no. Oh my god. It's so good. You you should watch you would probably be so into it. It's really good. Aren't there like it's ten so seasons? Smart. Listen, but it's so good. <laughs> it's one of the best shows and it's so smart in case anyone is not aware bethany has not seen hamilton i would just like that to be known no usually well, i'm the one telling me how i should watch listen, Battlestar Galactica. no well i'm just surprised because usually you've seen all of the things it's rare that there's something that i've seen that you haven't but they're so good and they well, are i think really i was a kid when it was airing and it wasn't something my parents were into and yeah i didn't watch it when it came so. out like our friends got us into it like years ago i don't know i watched it after it had all come out already and we just kind of like binged it honestly it was so good but the thing is is when you know think about when it came out it's so fascinating because it's very much in conversation with what was happening at the time anyway it's great um indeed okay. how has she not seen it when it is on disney plus and i know she has disney plus i do have disney plus but who has time there are so many things to watch really <laughs> I should I should watch it at some point. I just like I didn't. Which see is it a greater really. cultural touchstone, Battlestar Galactica or Hamilton? <laughs> Listen, Battlestar Galactica is so so good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, yeah. Okay, where? Is... But so this is where also like I hope that my um disdain for the show is something that you're beginning to pick up. Uh, not that you're understanding, not that you didn't get that I felt that way. I'm saying I'm hoping you're beginning to feel it too because it, having read the books, when you come to the show, it's like, where is all of the nuance and where is all the depth and where is mm -hmm. all the subtlety? Geralt literally just stands there and looks attractive. Like, there's nothing to him in this show. Like, yeah. Siri is just kind of like pretty and like is learning how to fight. Okay that's it like that's all there's going on with her like yeah I mean I guess the thing is though is I don't know that I would expect a lot more than that from a Netflix adaptation of something I just because I just don't think that's usually what they make like usually Stranger I don't Stranger Things has more depth nuance subtlety and character depth I think Stranger Things is like and really Stranger Things also is about the USSR <laughs> I like Stranger Things. I kind of lost steam with. I thought it was way too slowly paced, and I got bored. Um, I don't know. I enjoy the show, but I do see how it's like a very different property. D does anyone like the show? I like the show. It is. I different like from the, the song "Toss a I Coin to the Witcher." Um, but yeah, I don't know. This is an okay. We have like all these comments. Uh. Having grown up at approximately the same time, it was easy to see the world politics of the time throughout these books, but we're all focused on such different things now. Isn't that always, always true? Yeah, that the series would read really differently for different generations. Yeah. They're making a movie of Best of Cold, really? How have you missed this news? Everyone's been buzzing about it. <laughs> I Jessica thought... Ferguson. No, Rebecca Ferguson. Rebecca Ferguson, who played Jessica, that's where that name came from, is um, supposed to be playing Monza. I think we just sometimes are in different circles. That's not the buzz I've been hearing about. That's exciting. Joe Abercrombie wrote the script. Hey, oh, that's very exciting. Yes, thank you, Jessica. You should watch BS. Yes, that will start glad It's great. I should watch Hamilton. Oh God, yeah. Okay, I could I could watch Hamilton. <laughs> I meant to send it to you. I don't think I did, but it was like shortly after you had told me that you hadn't seen Hamilton. There was a reel that was like. When someone tells me that they haven't seen Hamilton and it's like <laughs> King George going, I wasn't aware that was something a person could do. I'm perplexed. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, yeah. 
I don't know. Maybe we can do another one of those like Patreon collabs and I'll watch Hamilton. I'll do it for content. (laughs) Um, Okay. Let's see. When they adapted The Witcher show, I was glad they got rid of the monologues, but was disappointed that all the flavor of the characters were removed. Yeah, that's fair. I guess it's hard if you read a lot of the books before, because I had only read The Last Wish before watching the show. (laughs) Veronica Mars was great. It's not hard to have more depth than The Witcher show. Yeah. It's fun, though. I mean, it's also quite slow and boring. I don't know. I had fun with it. Um, I like the show. What? I'm confused. The show is good, but the books are more fulfilling. Yes. Yeah. Like the show is, it's fun, but it doesn't leave as much of a lasting impression. Yeah. I would agree with that. Um, Anything else that we wanted to talk about before we move on? Well, we didn't talk about Siri rejecting her magic. Can't imagine oh. that's going to have repercussions. Yeah, that was that was interesting. Well, but the thing is, too, right? Is it's like that's also how she survived because there was like some voice talking about taking her life until she did that because they were like sure she was going to like be harmful or something. I don't know what the voice was or what's going on with that, but. I think you no. Know, the voice was saying about killing everything else, and Siri was like, "No, I don't want to be part of that." Hmm. Well, I think that maybe there were like two boys. I don't know. There was something that was talking about ta- maybe taking her life, but I I don't remember exactly what happened. It was a little bit weird. Um. But yeah, it seems like I mean you are right. She didn't want to be a part of like what she was shown would happen. And then she took up with a street gang. Yeah. And then at the end of the book, they're like, we're going to execute all of them. Cliffhanger. <laughs> and someone is like, hey, that one who's in the rats, she might be Siri. Nah, she's not. Don't investigate it. Kill them all. Just kill them. Yeah. But I mean, the person who's saying to kill them all very actively is like, because the other guy's like, we should look into it. He's like, do not look into it kill them all Mm -hmm. like very specifically yeah i'm sure we'll get more of that in the next book next month (laughs) more siri are you sure (laughs) i think so (laughs) i think the next book is when we finally get um the vampire who i adore there's a vampire there's a vampire fun and he's very amusing apparently someone says we meet the best polymath character of all time okay that sounds fun cool well i'm looking forward to it um so we are going to go into on our radar where we talk about uh recent book releases and sci-fi fantasy since the stuff that has come out in may i don't know if liana has anything this time <laughs> we'll i see. do but it's not sci-fi fantasy that's okay whatever it is um but First, if you enjoy the podcast, we always appreciate if you take a moment to rate and review us so we can continue to reach more listeners. Again, if you are interested in getting early access to episodes and exclusive bonus content with every episode, consider supporting us on Patreon. And we'll have that bonus content for this episode is going to be talking more about the use of sexual violence towards women in fantasy. That'll be interesting. Thank you to all of our supporting patrons who make this possible, including our world expander patron, Stephanie. We appreciate all of you. And also next episode, I'll be back with Izzy to continue with our Dark Olympus series read along discussing Wicked Beauty by Katie Robert. June 13th will be the next episode. So, um, okay. So you have a book. I do. Yay. It came out in May. I haven't read it yet. Cool. Shakespeare was a woman in other heresies. How Doubting the Bard Became the Biggest Taboo in Literature. It's nice. about just like the following up all the like, all the different conspiracies about it, but also the modern day, like it says, like how Doubting the Bard Became the Biggest Taboo about how like, it's kind of 
um, forbidden to even question it. Like people do question it. There are conspiracy theories, but like in like uh, collegiate circles, like you're not like allowed to ask that question that like people are like, how dare you? How dare you question the bard? So I'm quite excited to read it. It's nice. a pretty cool cover too with the whole Shakespeare yeah. was a woman with the like. Um... Yeah, I like it. Because there's that's one of the theories. Um, mm -hmm. There are people that think that Shakespeare was actually Queen Elizabeth. Which, you know, I guess anything's possible. <laughs> Seems unlikely, but I guess. Like the reasons for it aren't like it's not literally just people like completely like. Right. You know, there there are reasons for it, but it, I still don't think it's a very good theory. <laughs> Interesting. Um, okay, so I've got a few. Dragonfall by L.R. Lamb. I haven't read it, but it looks interesting. It's, uh, I think, a debut fantasy. Long banished dragons revered as gods return to the mortal realm in the first in a new epic fantasy trilogy. Also, we have um, Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yaros, which has been everywhere. Liana, you shouldn't read it. You would hate it. But um, I know my patients have told me. <laughs> you would hate it. I loved it. It was great. Um, <laughs> but so it's fun if you like a mag if you want like a magic school that's college age with kind of a slow burn enemies to lovers romance and dragon riders and like it's fun. I had a good time with it. It gave me what I wanted, but yeah, you would hate it, which is fine. Um, yeah. <laughs> the Salt Grows Heavy by Cassandra Ka is a novella that's like really weird and super dark. It's kind of drawing on the original Little Mermaid mythology, but then make it very macabre and violent. <laughs> And like monstrous, it's really it's really interesting. I was gonna say it's the original Little Mermaid novella. story is not happy, and no, traditional mythology no. about sirens is not very pleasant. It, it's no, it's really not. But this like takes it. It sort of like takes that as a premise and then spins out her future after like she and her children have like killed the husband that she married, and now she's off doing other things. <laughs> it's very interesting. It sounds a little bit like um, what's that Little Mermaid, the stabby version that came out like oh, three oh, years oh, ago. Oh, I know what you're talking about. I can see the cover, but I can't. Yeah. I don't remember. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this is a novella, and it's horror. It's like a horror novella. And now I'm just bothered that I can't remember the name. It has. It's like a one word title, I think. Mm, no, I think. Really? I read it because I know you sent it to me because you really liked it. I did. I forgot I sent it to you. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Um, okay, last one I have is again one I haven't, I bought it. <laughs> I haven't read it yet, but it looks interesting. To Shape a Dragon's Breath by Monica Black Goose. It's about a young indigenous woman who enters a colonizer run dragon academy and quickly finds herself at odds with the approved way of doing things. It's the first in a new fantasy series. It sounds fun. So. To Kill a Kingdom. To Kill a Kingdom. Yes. It was not a one word title. You're right. It was not. <laughs> it was not. Yep. That was it. Anyway, so go check all of those out if you're interested. They'll be in the show notes. And uh, again, I'll be back June 13th with Izzy and probably some guests to talk about Wicked Beauty by Katie Robert, if you're following along for that. And then at the end of June, we have the next book in this Witcher series. <laughs> what is, what's the next one? Baptism, Baptism of, fire. of Fire. Okay, so we'll be doing that. Um, thank you all for joining us. This has been Chapter 3 Podcast. We're your hosts, Stephanie and Liana. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Chapter 3 Podcast. And you can find us on our individual YouTube channels. Um, join us June 13th for the next episode. And this episode's bonus content will be available to patrons in the next few days. Thanks for listening. <laughs>